Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Happy Sunday day, or a couple days, a few days after Thanksgiving. <coughs> Hope you all enjoyed a wonderful time of fellowship with your family and friends. So we would just love to take this time to worship our Lord.
strength is in your name. For you alone can say, you will deliver me. Yours is the victory. Whom shall just knowing that God's angel armies are always by your side. So we don't have to fear. Praise God. He's always there for us. Thank you, Lord. Please take this time to say hello to one another.
No? Good morning, Calvary Chapel, Roseville. How are you today? People have some parkas and coats on, a little chilly out there. We have some announcements to go through here. Oh, boy. Dropping the hammer over there. Wow, most of you decided to go over here. Okay, so let's go through some of these announcements. We do have Bible studies throughout the week. It is getting to be the end of the year, but it's not too late to jump into one. Men, we meet on Tuesday evenings, going through the book of 2 Samuel. In this case, we have chapter 21 and 22. Uh, Wednesdays, the Bible bus is going through the book of Acts. This has child care provided. So if the whole family wants to come, that is a good time to do that. And that is 7 p.m. on Wednesdays. Ladies, you have your Bible study in the book of Esther. Um, if you've missed any, there are copies of Lessons 2, 3, and 4 on Kathy's desk. But that is Thursday mornings at 10 a.m. So there's definitely Bible studies there. Uh, if you remember last week, we had um, Opera's Christmas Child. <coughs> Excuse me, and we collected them all. It came to 135 boxes, so very nice. So that was fantastic. Um, let's see. We have Toys for Tots campaign. You'll notice a large white box there. Um, these are to collect unwrapped, new unwrapped toys, which will be given to the Marine Corps to distribute to less fortunate children. Toy categories may include sporting equipment, books, backpacks, board games, etc. Uh, primary goals for Marine Toys to Toys for Tots is through the gift of a new toy, bring joy of Christmas, and send a message of hope to needy children. So um, you'll see that box is going to be out there for, I don't have a date here, but for a while, right? So if you have any new toys you can drop in there, that would be great. Uh, let's see, anything else? I think that's all we have. We have a Christmas Eve service coming up on the 24th of next month. And also we're still looking for um, Sunday school um, teachers, if you can, many hands mate, make like light work. I can never say that right, but you know what I'm saying. Um, that's all we have for announcements. I pray for the offering. Worship team can come up. Precious Lord, we thank you so much for this day, Lord. Um, so much to be thankful, Lord. We just went through Thanksgiving, went through it like it's a trial. Lord, it was great. It was wonderful. Uh, but uh, like I said, so much to be thankful, Lord, and we thank you for so many blessings, we cannot number them all, Lord Jesus. Um, take these tithes and offering and use them for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen.
precious Lord, you remain faithful to us, faithful to your word, faithful to your promises, um, when we are not faithful to any of that, Lord. Uh, it is an amazing thing to, if we can, for just a moment to pause, back up, and see what you have indeed done for us through all of our lives. So we thank you for this. Bless your word as preached this day in Jesus' name. Amen. When, you have a, when they have a practice, he wants to come. Oh, but nobody's here. All right, so this is the scripture. This is the scripture for... Or if the man has no one to redeem it, but he himself becomes a... There are absolutes in this world, and God is God, is one of them, and we are not, is another. That's kind of made obvious in the everydayness of life. This morning we're in Ruth, the book of Ruth, after Judges, Ruth chapter 1. We'll have an introduction, so turn there in your Bibles. If you don't have a Bible, raise your hand and we'll get a Bible to you. Okay, we will project. Let's pray. Father, thank you that all Scripture is inspired by you, by the Holy Spirit, the living God, and is profitable for correction and for reproof, for training and righteousness so that we might, as men and women of God, we can be equipped for every good work for you, Lord, used by you. We pray that as we turn to this historic record, as we're introduced to the lives of those who lived so long ago, in those times so far away, we can see where they were right and where they were wrong. We can see what you were doing for them, through them, and we can discover the relevancy to us this day in our lives. 
in the year of our Lord, 2020. We seek to hear you, Lord, to hear your heart, to hear these words in your mind. And Lord, help us quicken our thought process. Help us to be able to understand. Help us to take these words off the pages and let them jump into our hearts. That's our desire this morning, Lord. And we humbly seek you this day. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. The book of Ruth is a love story about love and redemption. Redemption, the Hebrew word is ga'al, and is a key concept throughout the book of Ruth, and actually throughout the whole Bible, throughout every book, there's a red thread of redemption. Now, the basic use of this word redemption had to do with the deliverance of people, as Jeremy read, who were in bondage, who had been sold into slavery because of owing debt, or their goods that had been pawned, basically, that had been taken to someone with money because they had no money, so they would take their property, their land, their cattle, whatever, and, and, and get some money for it. And so we know that in the Bible there is recourse for having lost something, whether it be property or whether it be yourself, because of debt. And then there, at the end, Jeremy read about the year of Jubilee, that every 50 years clean slate all over Israel, all debts forgiven every 50 years. Great thing. We get some of these things from Deuteronomy. uh, They're taken and we use them in our system of justice, of financial civic justice with bankruptcy and whatnot. (coughs) Now, redemption is important, of course. And as we know and we go over week by week, month by month, year by year, without a Redeemer, without Jesus, we'd be lost. Amen? And so here in the Bible, the scriptures that Jeremy read were about the kinsman Redeemer. It was about a family member who by law was allowed to come along and redeem you or your property that had been put in hock, had been taken. Now, here's Pastor Chuck's intro to the book. It's written in the 10th century B.C. It's one of only two books in the Bible named after a woman. What book is the other book? Esther. The women are going through Esther on Tuesday mornings. Ruth takes place after the period of Judges, which because of national backsliding on the part of Israel and the people, the nation of Israel, <coughs> is the, they are the people, because of national backsliding, was a dark time in the history of the nation of Israel. Big problems. It's an important book. <coughs> Ruth is the only book that connects David to the tribe of, tribe of Israel. The book tra- traces the genealogy of Jesus back to David. And so it's very, very important. Now, this book is confirmation that God wants to reach the whole world, not just his chosen, the Jewish people. Ruth was a Moabitess. To the Jews, a Moabite was a member of a cursed race. Ruth grew up in a culture of paganism and idolatry in Moab. But throughout the testimony of Ruth's Jewish mother-in-law, But through the testimony of of Ruth's Jewish mother-in-law, Ruth came into faith in the God of Israel and would ultimately be in the line of Jesus Christ, the Messiah. And that foreshadows our ultimate inclusion as Gentiles in God's plan for us to be grafted into God's family. And another important fact This book illustrates the biblical principle of the kinsman redeemer law. This was the law by which a close relative could take over the right of inheritance and redeem the inheritance when the heir was unable to do so. 
And this is why Jesus, our kinsman redeemer, had to redeem us. We were unable to redeem ourselves. He, as our close relative, stepped in and paid the price for our redemption on the cross at Calvary. A beautiful thing. This is a love story, the book of Ruth. It's a love story between God and his people and how God so loves us. It serves as a bright light in the dark time, showing us how God prepared a family through which he could reach out in his love for the world to redeem us to himself. Thank you, Pastor Chuck, for that concise summary. Summary. Now, the central character of the first chapter is a woman named Naomi, who is sometimes called in these times the Old Testament prodigal daughter because she said this in Ruth chapter 1, verse 21. I went out full, and the Lord has brought me home again empty. Now, the prodigal son could have used these same exact words in his situation. <clears throat> in the New Testament, when the prodigal son returned to his father, he could have echoed this. I went out full <clears throat> from his father's land, and the Lord brought him home again empty. And so some refer to Ruth as a prodigal daughter because she went out into Mo, um, in Moab and, and she came back empty. The book also not only establishes but provides testimony to the truth that God graciously preserves a godly person or people, a nation, who do what is right in his sight instead of doing right <coughs> in their own sight. In this includes an entire nation. Now, we know that we can sum up this book with they were doing what is right in their own eyes. Deuteronomy chapter 12, verse 8. You shall not at all do as we are doing here today, Every man doing whatever is right in his own eyes. Hello, America. Hello, Christian American. Doing what is right in their own eyes. The book of Ruth has been called a love story, but Ruth is much more than a beautiful love story. And in fact, the word love is not found in the narrative at all, anywhere. Ruth is the story of how one person's faithfulness can influence her whole community, his whole community, and then could go on to influence a city, a state, a country, and even the world. The book of Ruth also establishes divine providence in the day-to-day workings of or ordinary people like us and how our lives play an intimate role in the unfolding of the plan of redemp redemption, salvation. How our actions and the everydayness of life are of the utmost importance. I was talking this morning with a brother, and we were t it was Daryl, and we were talking about how we must be on guard, we must be careful as to how, how our, what our behavior is and our words when we're out in the world amongst the unbelievers. So that when we leave a couple of unbelievers that we've been talking with and whatnot, they say, oh, there goes a Christian. And not that they say, was that a Christian? But that they get something good. They get a taste of God, not a taste of sour grapes from us. Not a long face, but some joy, some life, wisdom, godly truth. So important. And that happens in the everydayness of life. Not in your rhetoric, not in your talk, you know, not when you're at your, on your best behavior, and not when you're you know, inserting a praise the Lord in there or 
yeah, you know, if Lord is willing, God is willing, or, or those moments. It comes in the moments when you're not thinking, when you're not trying to insert Christianity, <clears throat> but unbeknownst to you, you are inserting Christianity. In the moments where you're not what's right in my mind, what I think is right, but what the Bible says is right. And so much of what we spend our time doing has really very little to do with what the Bible talks about. But it has everything to do with it because it's our witness. It's how people will judge us, what they'll think of us. If we say something that's re sort of racist, well, then they're going to call you a racist. And it's very easy to, to, to say something that, you know, you didn't really mean to be an insult to anyone. But it's taken that way in this day and age. And we have to be aware of these things. Now in Ruth 1, Now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land. Now we know there were famines all the time. Now we haven't really had a famine in this country for decades. But there was the Dust Bowl. That was a terrible famine in this country. And it doesn't mean we can't have another Dust Bowl. Certainly, we are not excluded from such things that the rest of the world goes through. It can happen here, but it's not happening right now. And a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went to dwell in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. Now, when famine hits, often those who have the wherewithal to move on to greener pastures, do so. Hey, I can't feed my kids. I can't keep the, the roof over our heads. I don't want the kids growing up in a moral ghetto like we have out there here in California. People were leaving Israel because of famine, just as people are leaving California because of famine because of what they see as a moral famine, a cost of living famine. Uh, Marianne, don't shut it off completely because the live stream doesn't hear this, or didn't last time. A cost of living famine. San Francisco, New York City, because of boarded up stores and restaurants, an epidemic of uncontrolled homelessness and crime. Okay, we're all watching Jennifer. <laughs> Good try. The San Francisco, New York City, because of boarded up stores and restaurants, an epidemic of uncontrolled crime and homelessness. And that's why it's so much more expensive to rent a moving van from California, say, to Arkansas. If you Rent a moving van from California to Arkansas, it's $5,500 for a 26-footer plus gas. Now, if you rent a, that same exact moving van with the same exact license plates from Arkansas to California, it's $1,000 plus gas. Why? Well, yeah, and lack of relocation, both relocation and re lack of relocation. The thing is, a lot of Californians are relocating, but no one in Arkansas is. And so you get budget, budget uh, rentals van out there to Arkansas, and there's no one to take it back. And so who are they going to charge? Well, they charge the guy leaving from California. Just like containers coming from China, on this end, containers are super cheap to buy. Why? Because thousands upon thousands every week, containers come to America from China, but don't go back. And so therefore, if you want a container in your backyard, uh, if you've got 10 acres or whatever, and use it for storage, it's, it's super cheap, but not so cheap in China. Now, <coughs> And in the midst of these, uh, let's see, 
The story of Ruth is taking place at the end of re the reign of the judges. <clears throat> now, it's difficult to nail down, but Ruth probably took place around 1,000 BC, 1,000 years before Christ. And judges took place during a 250 to 350 year time span. That's also hard to nail down. In Israel, where apostasy, apathy, and anarchy associated with idolatry, immorality, and war rained hard on the land. In God's timing, 300 years is a flash in the pan. Yet here on earth, many generations lived out their lives in that time of judges, that 300 or so span. And in the midst of these very dramatic and dark times, we have this wonderful narrative, this record of God's dealings in such a way as to remind people in every generation that no matter how hard, how hard and dark the events of life may appear to be in your life or in your country, that God still has his people and is still working his purposes out in our lives and in our nation and is often choosing to do so in places that we would regard as very unlikely. The Israelites were going through another cycle of over and over again, on and off worship of God. On and off, on and off. They would worship God and be blessed. They would turn away from God when things were too good and think that they were doing it. They, think they would think they were in control. They think that the, the good things that were happening was because of their efforts and whatnot, and they would leave God out. The good results would bring bad results. They would turn back to God when things went sour. They would end up in bondage, and so they would turn back to God. And when they turned back to him, he would raise up a deliverer. When they would return to worshiping him, God would come along and, and pull them out. He'd save them, deliver them from the bondage they were in. Now, the Days of Judges was a dark season for Israel, and a long dark season. And you can sum it up with Judges 17.6. Everyone did what was right in his or her own eyes. Ruth, Ruth verse 1. Now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land and a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went to dwell in the country of Moab, he and his wife and two sons. Now Bethlehem means in Hebrew the house of bread. And it usually was a land blessed with great harvest there in Israel, almost always. But God wasn't blessing them, or maybe he was blessing them with hard times. It's difficult to know. And there is little bread to eat, that's for sure. And this man takes his hungry family over the little traveled Jericho Pass. It wasn't a comfortable pass, but it saved time if you were journeying. And then they journey through the Judean wilderness near the Dead Sea. And then they cross over the Jordan River into the pagan land of Moab. We will see, like Jonah, good things do not come from tra traveling the wrong way or to the wrong place. Good things did not come to Jonah when he tried that. He ended up in the belly of a whale for three days. And things, good things aren't going to come to this man and his family. Now, mind you, he had left Israel, God's promised land, only to go back into the wilderness that God had delivered the Israelites from hundreds of years earlier. And worse yet, they go beyond into the land of Moab. So basically, he was backsliding, going the wrong way. 
Now, maybe you find yourself in a wilderness this morning of backsliding, not reading the word enough, not in prayer, not in fellowship, whatever, out there in live stream world. Now, the fact that this man would make the decision to leave Israel to go to Moab is rather astonishing because of two reasons. First of all, all Jews at that time knew that God resided in Israel. That was their belief, that God was in Israel. God was in the temple. God was blessing the country, his chosen people, and he didn't hang out with the Gentiles. He didn't like the Gentiles. The Gentiles were cursed. They were heathen. They were pagans. They worshiped other gods. And so if you really wanted to be where the center was, we don't have a center in the United States. There have been outbreaks of, of revival, outbreaks of the Holy Spirit, and there are those Christians that will move to that place when they know that this is happening because they want to be part of that. They want to be in the center where they see, well, God's there. But we don't really have a center here. Now, we have the Bible Belt, but the Bible Belt isn't what it once was, unfortunately. It's still called the Bible Belt, but if you look at it and you look at the demographics and whatnot, it really, you know, it, it's far from the center of Christianity. It was in the land that he had given to them that a Jew wanted to reside. And therefore, for this man whose name in Hebrew means the Lord is my king, that's what this man's name means. And we'll, the scripture will tell us soon enough that man's name. But it means the Lord is my king. And for him to head out to a foreign land indicates he really wasn't trusting in the kingship of his Lord, his self-proclaimed Lord. At least not at this point. It looks like he's taking matters into his own hands. And the second reason that is so mind-blowing is found in Deuteronomy chapter 23, 3 through 6. God's word, an Ammonite or a Moabite shall not enter the assembly of the Lord, even to the tenth generation. None of his descendants shall enter the assembly of the Lord forever because they did not meet with you. They did not meet you with bread and water on the road when you came out of Egypt and because they hired against you Balaam, the son of Beor from Pethor of Mesopotamia to curse you. Nevertheless, the Lord your God would not listen to Balaam, but the Lord your God turned the curse into a blessing for you because the Lord your God loves you. You shall not seek their peace, nor their, what? Prosperity all your days, and what? Forever. So we have a contradiction there. This man is going to Moab. Why? To seek their prosperity. God had promised that Israel would have plenty as long as they were obedient. As long as they were obedient. Now, obedience does not mean that they would obey every single precept and never, ever slip or sin doesn't mean that but what it does mean at the heart of it is that they would not forsake God's holiness that they would not worship other gods but that they would worship the one and only God Jehovah that they would forsake that they had not been obedient during the time of judges and so in verses 2 through 5 bad things happen in Moab. The name of the man was Elimelech. The name of his wife was Naomi. And the name of his two sons were Malon and Chilion. 
Ephrathites of Bethlehem, Judah, and they went to the country of Moab and remained there. Then Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died and she was left and her two sons. Now they took wives, the two sons took wives of the woman of the Moab. The name of the one was Orpah and the name of the other Ruth and they dwelt there about 10 years. Then both Malon and Chilion also died. So the woman survived her two sons and her husband. Did good things happen in Moab? Uh, no, no. And meanwhile, the name Elimelech means God is king. But what happened? Elimelech hadn't lived as if God was his king, and he was elimelected. He was eliminated. What was most likely intended to be a short stay in heathen land, in Moab land, a time where you would go and you'd wait for the famine to be over and then you'd go back home, ended up being the end of him. He never made it back to Israel. Sad story. He never got back there. In Amos chapter 7, verse 17, to be buried, for a Jew to be buried in an unclean foreign land was considered the ultimate of punishments. The ultimate of punishments. It wasn't dying well. It wasn't leaving a great legacy behind. It was just bad news. Now, we can't say for sure this was God's judgment against them because there was a motivation to survive, to feed the kids. And so there are those things which must, must be taken into account, even though it's often taught that they were totally in the wrong and what weren't trusting in God. And these things are also true. But when your kids are crying, Dad, I, I'm, my stump, I'm my belly, I'm hungry. And it's three days of my belly is hungry. And you've been evicted from where you live because you don't have the money to pay. An agrarian society, famine comes. Farmers and, and gleaners and everything else lose their jobs. Well, what is one to do? But look, but then again, do you have to look to Moab? Because Moab certainly would not have been the only place where the fam where there was prosperity, but yet that's what they did. They looked towards Moab. Now, as I said, the story of Ruth is taking place at the end of the reign of Judges, a time span in Israel where apostasy, apathy, and anarchy associated with idolatry, immorality, and war rained hard on the land. Now, people are having to live through this time, and God is with them, and he's dealing with them. And that's the story that we're looking at, what happened to them. But, of course, we can always apply it to what happens to us, what is happening to us right now. And I'm not going into that. I'm not like, you know, going to, you know, say, oh, there's some prophetic stuff or, or whatever, because we've got enough of that out there. You know, there's like prophets are coming out of the woodwork right now. But we know that this, the pasture was not greener on the other side of the fence for Elimelech and his family there in Moab. It was not greener pastures. We know that. And sometimes it's incomprehensible to understand why tragic things happen. You just don't know exactly. Because they left Israel, we'll never know what staying in Judah in Israel would have looked like. Maybe if they had stayed, God would have provided, could have provided in many different ways. A rich relative comes along and says, hey, you know what? I've got a storehouse of food. Or uh, they run into a stranger in their, in their travels there in Israel and and the stranger says, hey, you know, don't worry about food. I've got plenty. And I'll get here, I'll fill your, your little 
whatever storehouse up with food. We don't know. And so we don't know means that God doesn't always tell us that when we move in a certain direction, it's right or wrong. And sometimes, even when we move in the wrong direction, I won't even say sometimes, I believe personally that even when you make a mistake, that God is good. Even when you make the move. We had a family here who moved to Bozie, Idaho. They sold their home here, and they left for Bozy. They traveled towards Bozy, and the more they traveled, they kept saying, is it going to get better? Is it going to get better? But it didn't get better because they had never been to Bozy before. They had friends there who convinced them to go. And they got there, and it didn't get better. And so they ended up coming back here, and fortunately they were able to get their home back for $5,000 that they had sold and uh, didn't lose the home that they had left. And so it, that wasn't a good move. You know, God didn't honor that move. But sometimes what will happen is you'll end up in Bozy or you'll end up wherever, and it wasn't really what God wanted. It wasn't his best. But what happens is then God blesses you there because you're faithful to him, you worship him, Maybe you even repent and say, oh, I wish I hadn't moved here, Lord, but now I'm here. I can't really go back. And so, Lord, that's, what, what are you going to do with this place? And we're, this book is about what God does in that place of Moab. We're going to see that in coming chapters, how God blesses them, how a blessing comes out of Moab. And so a blessing can come out of any place, but, you know, for me, I'd rather not have to go through some things that I need not go through. And so I'd rather, you know, be sure that I'm in the right direction. And in the end here, we're going to see Naomi's daughter-in-law come out of the bad move knowing the Lord. And so that's a good thing. And that'll influence generations to come. Now, it may have happened in Moab. It may have happened in Israel that she would have come out knowing the Lord. But it so happened that she met Naomi in Moab. And this can be used as an example of how we can move, how we can move away from our problems only to bring them with us. And they follow us to the new location. Problem is, no matter what, where we go, we bring ourselves with us. And so the pr same problems can continue in a different place. And so you really have to go before the Lord, get on your knees and pray and do your due diligence, your D&D, &D, and, and, and then, you know, pray, Lord, bless this. When we moved up here, we had questions. We, we had a church down there. We, we, um, the, I was interim senior, and the senior came back, and it wasn't working out with, you know, I just wasn't satisfied after having been senior with being uh, going back as an assistant. And so uh, one of the elders said, well, we'll start a church down the road here and I'll pay you the salary myself that you're making now at the church. And he was a TV producer in Hollywood and a good Christian. And he for him, I didn't have to worry about financial security because that the money I was making was for him an easy commitment to make. But then I said, no, I can't do that because people will leave this church and come to the new church. And that's building on upon an, another man's foundation. And so we came up here with 18 plastic folding chairs to start a church in our living room in North Highlands with, with three people. But God blessed it. God worked it out. Now, two weeks before we left, I was offered a church in Venice Beach that was paid for, that had a, the parking lot had just been done. It had a pastor's office with a shower and bath. It, you know, it was a missionary outreach. The missionary group paid the pastor $30,000 base salary. And then when the tithe and the offerings came in, you could you know, get more than that. But Leslie and I were tempted and we both talked about it, prayed about it, and we said, wait, what did God tell us to do? Go to Sacramento. And so here we are. 
We left Moab. We had said we'd never live in L.A., but ended up doing it. Now, the problem here is, though, things can happen in Moab if you're not careful. They took wives. The two sons took wives of the woman of Moab. Malon and Chilean, their names mean sickly and pining, became adults and married Moabite woman, pagan, heathen, one named Orpah and the other Ruth. And this was against God's instruction. God said, you do not, people of Israel, you do not marry those heathen pagans from nations that surround us. Now, what do we call that when you do, when you marry someone? Unequally yoked. We call it being unequally yoked. And if your child, if, if you are considering out there in live stream world or here, marrying someone who is not a Christian, take heed. It will not work out well for you. You will be unequally yoked. And the New Testament tells us, do not be unequally yoked. It'll be nothing but a problem. It'll be like this, dark and light. One spirit and another spirit. I know, personally know people who struggle with that. And you know, I don't say get divorced by any means, because you did it. You know, you made that decision. And now you have to live with it. But it's not easy. Now, as, ta as time went on, about 10 years time, Naomi's sons die. And so now there were three childless widows, Naomi and her two daughters-in-law, daughters Orpha and Ruth. Now, Worsby says, a family makes a bad decision and exchanges one famine for three funerals. In the ancient time in Israel, to be a child, childless widow was to be among the lowest, most disadvantaged of groups, of people groups. Naomi had no family in Moab, hence no support, and she was in desperate straits. And so in verses 6 through 7, the three widows put their heads together. Then she arose with her daughters-in-law that she might return from the country of Moab, for she had heard in the country of Moab that the Lord had visited his people by giving them bread. Ten years later, after she loses her husband, after she loses her two sons, after she ends up with two heathen daughter-in-laws, what happens? She gets word from Israel, from Judah, now there is bread. The famine is over. And we're going to stop there. What's going to happen? Naomi, after getting word, is going go back. She's going to put her faith and trust in God's goodness. And she decides it's time to leave Moab to go where she knows God is working. She could have stayed at, at, in Moab waiting for things to change, for things to happen. But she didn't. And next week we'll see her go proactive. Next week homeward bound. Let's pray. Lord, we come before you, and Father God, we thank you that we can always be at home, Lord, with you. And Father, we thank you that we would be those who would not have to go through the cycle of Israel, of on and off worship of you, of being lukewarm, which is worse than being hot or cold. And Father God, we just give thanks that this morning we can know what it means to be unequally yoked, and we can advise those in our community, Lord, our family members, our friends, our co-workers, 
that being unequally yoked is not a good thing. And it, the first and foremost consideration when marrying should be, is the person a Christian? That should be not how they look, not how much money they have, none of that stuff. Not even if they're a good person or a bad person, but are they a Christian, a real, bona fide, born again Christian? And that should always be our counsel, first and foremost. And so, Lord, we come before you, and also with our decision-making, we pray that we would be those who would pray and discern and, and seek your word before we make a move, Lord. And a move can be very close or very far, Lord. It can be a move to, to do something, to take a job, to buy something. To, it can be all, there's all kinds of moves in life. And so, Lord, we just come before you and we give thanks, Lord that you are with us. And we give thanks for the fact that we can see you, your omniscience and your omnipresence and your omnipotence in the book of Ruth and your love and holiness. And so, Lord, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I beseech you this day, please, please give the Lord a try. It's simple. All you have to do is ask Jesus into your life. Repent of your sin. Yes, I made mistakes. I've made wrong moves, wrong decisions in my life. But I'm ready for something new, something different. I'm ready to be born again, to have a new life. Not to recreate myself in some new place, but to be recreated right where I stand or where you sit. Or maybe you're in your bed watching this. And so, Lord God, we come before you. We're all sinners. We're not better than anyone else. We're just better off because we're redeemed. And Lord, let anyone out there who wants to receive you just ask you into their life. Lord, come into my life. I repent of my past life, my sins, those things that I regret. And now I come to you asking for what you would have to offer not even knowing what that is exactly, but knowing it's this thing of being born again, of being delivered from bondage. And Lord, that you might deliver me. And for those of us who know that we have been walking in Moabite land, territory, land, Lord, that we would just get out of there and come back to the, the holy place, the, the holy land, the holy ground. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, people, God bless. Thank you.